Constantine, it is so great to meet you and have you on. Um, I do work like this so I can meet people like you. So I really appreciate the time. I know you're super busy. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, of course, our listeners won't know this, but I've been dicking you around for probably <laughs> months at this point about coming on the show. So thanks for your patience. And also thanks to your listeners' patience. If you hear my baby son crying in the next room <laughs> during this, uh, that, that may disrupt it. But anyway, thanks for having me on. And again, uh, apologies for messing you around. My pleasure, man. And uh, I, I very much understand. Um, I would love to start like I do with most of the guests in learning about your your personal background, which is going to mm. dovetail pretty nicely into what we will talk about today, which will partly be about the new book that is coming out that you've written about your life. Mm. You know, you, I've wanted to talk to you for many reasons, but one of them is that I think you have such an incredible window. There's, there, there's the baby right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, just at, at, a, at a high level, how do you think about that story for yourself? What, what was the, what were the first couple of decades of your life like, and how did you end up in the West in the first place? Right. Well, I had a very interesting story, I think, uh, in terms of my childhood, because I was born in the Soviet Union and I lived in different parts of the Soviet Union. I lived in Russia, in Uzbekistan. I spent some time in Ukraine while it was still all Soviet. And then the Soviet Union collapsed. And when it collapsed, my parents were basically poor students uh, who just got their first jobs uh, working as scientists. Both my parents are bi biochemical engineers. Uh, and of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the demand for scientists also collapsed. There was no one to pay them. Their status, which in the Soviet Union was very high. You know, the scientists were some of the best paid people, the most respected people in society. Suddenly, no one really cared too much about them. And what happened was my dad became involved in a small business. And of course, remember, in the Soviet Union, business didn't exist. It was illegal, in fact. Right. Um, so they started a small business in early 90s Russia. And then that business became another business. And then that business became another business. And within like two years, they suddenly founded one of Russia's biggest and first banks. That's the sort of time it was like you could just like start a small, small like shop. And then within a couple of years, you had a bank. That's the sort of opportunities were, that were available at the time. So I went from living in a very stable but very poor Soviet environment to living in a very unstable, very poor early 90s Russian environment to suddenly my family being extremely rich and enjoying all the opportunities that were on offer to the point where actually... Uh, my family, I didn't have time, uh, space in the book to talk about this, but we lived in one of the country, they're called dachas in Russian, the former country houses of one of the party bosses outside of Moscow, um, which doesn't exist anymore, actually, which is interesting because it was uh, the area, the land was bought by one of the most recent oligarchs under Vladimir Putin. Uh, and it, it, it says something about the nature of the wealth disparities in Russia today, the, this huge, impressive building that we lived in in the early 90s, he, the first thing he did when he bought this land is he knocked it down because it was not good enough for what an oligarch mansion should look like in the 21st century. So I experienced you know, the lowest lows and the highest highs, I suppose, at least financially in that way, living through this chaotic period in which things changed on a dime just like that. So it's one of the reasons I'm very aware that while things in the West seem stable and permanent and things will always continue the way they've always been, actually, I've seen that that's not always the case. And sometimes things change very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, when they do, the impact on ordinary people is absolutely tragic because what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed is, you know, my family story is a very positive story, you might argue, although it did end with my family losing all the money that they accumulated anyway. But it was still a positive experience overall. And that's how my family were able to send me to boarding school in the UK, to your question. But I also saw, you know, somebody who was a, a professor, a respected professor at university uh, three weeks ago, suddenly they'd be selling their belongings outside a tube station, a metro station, because they, they no longer had a, a life. They no longer had a living. Uh, many people uh, killed themselves. Many people died of alcoholism. Uh, not unusual in Russia, but particularly high during those years. Um, you know, there was the emergence of things that just 
they were not part of our society in the Soviet Union. Most people had never met a prostitute. We would, didn't even know what they were. Mm. But suddenly this extreme poverty and wealth disparity created, you know, like I remember as like 11 year old kid knowing what a pimp was and what a prostitute was just because you couldn't escape it. It was all around you. You know, and and the stereotypes about Eastern European women being prostitutes that are commonplace everywhere, uh, they're a product of that time. They're a product of the fact that many people were so rapidly impoverished that for some women that felt like the only choice. That's how awful a time it was. And actually, many of the dysfunctions of Russian society that we see today, many of the uh, the reasons that people support a brutal dictator like Vladimir Putin actually come from this. I wrote a Substack piece about this called Why, Why Russians Support Vladimir Putin recently. So it was an extremely turbulent time, extremely chaotic time. And I witnessed it as a kid. You know, my dad was a, a wealthy banker. Then he was a, a junior minister in Boris Yeltsin's government. Then suddenly he was exiled from Russia and had to run away under a false identity. So it, it was quite a a quite a turbulent time for the country and a very turbulent time for my family as well and for me. Um, and when my parents sent me to boarding school in the UK, they basically took the remaining money that they had and just got me through school. That's what happened. And by the time I got to college, by the time I got to university, the money had run out. And so I'd kind of gone from going to this very elite, expensive private school to turning up at a very good university uh, to suddenly not having enough money to pay rent and at one point sleeping in, in a park for three weeks because I just didn't have money to to, to live on. Um, so by the time I was 18, I'd seen all of that. And I think it informs a lot of my opinions today. I think it also informs a lot of my personality today as well. You know, like I think I'm I'm a fairly resilient person because like I've, you know, I know what it's like to be sleeping in a park. I know what it's like to be, you know, I remember probably the, the worst thing that I remember about that time is I, I had no money and I was a smoker at the time. And I saw somebody dropped uh, who dropped an unfinished cigarette as they were boarding a bus. And I was like, oh, this is an opportunity. I, I picked up the cigarette that this guy just dropped off the floor and I finished it off, you know. So I remember all those things and I'm deeply, deeply determined never to go back there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know just in doing research for this conversation that, you know, your first of all, I'll say this as an American myself, who is always interested in history, mm. we had, we, in my experience, do a terrible job seemingly just by omission in educating the populace about the Soviet experience in mm. the 20th century. And that is information that I've had to go dig up myself that was not really conveyed in the public high school that I went to or in college, mm. even for somebody who was interested in history. And, you know, I know a little bit about your family background. One piece of information is that your grandmother was born in a gulag. Mm. You mentioned this as well in another interview that there has never been a democratic transition of power in the 1200 year history of Russia. Mm. There's so much information in you know Soviet history that I think is just it's utterly fascinating and utterly tragic to me. Mm. For a Western audience who has basically no exposure to that, we we were very well informed about the Third Reich, very well informed about European history, Western European history in the 20th century, but not very much so related to the Soviet experiment. What's salient to you that you think still matters to a modern audience about about that project and maybe for you personally, what you remember? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, we're going to struggle to cover all of Russian <laughs> psyche and history in the space of the next 55 minutes or how long we've got. Um, I, I think one of the things you, I do talk about my my grandmother in the book and her being born in a gulag, but it's not just that, you know, on the other side of my family. Um my grandmother, alive today, 96 years old in Ukraine now, perfectly compassmented. She can go talk to her. She'll tell you the stories. Uh, she lived through the Nazi occupation. But before that, she also lived through the, the repressions in the 30s. And because she was living in Soviet Ukraine, um, she her family experienced what they called a dekulakization, the kulaks. Yep. Uh, were these so supposedly um, 
wealthy peasants. See, the problem is every time I bring in a new term, I have to go back, you know, 50 years and give you a whole uh, piece of history to explain it. But uh, the Russian Revolution in about three, three seconds here, right? The idea is this. Society is deeply unfair. The rich and powerful, the 1%, we could call them, Dan, uh, the 1% control everything, the aristocracy, the czar, uh, they have all the resources, They and everybody else is essentially a slave, basically, right? The serfdom was only abolished in Russia a, a, a few decades before the Russian Revolution, so in the middle of the uh, 18th, 19th century, and serfdom is slavery, basically. Yeah. Serfdom meant that you as a peasant were attached to a piece of land, you had uh, a... Uh, a person, an aristocrat who owned that land and therefore owned you by attachment to it. He could whip you for any misdemeanors. He was slavery in every way. Um, So uh, Russia, prior to the Russian Revolution in 1917, deeply uh, in unequal society, deeply unfair society. It's sort of feudalistic pretty much, or it's certainly mo- mo- it's a monarchy, an absolute monarchy in which the czar, the king has all the power. And uh, these people come along and they say, guys, you know, this is really unfair. And everyone goes, yeah, this is really unfair. And they go, the reason this is unfair is the evil uh, bourgeois capitalist and the, the aristocracy who are oppressing you. And by the way, absolutely true. They were oppressing the, the working people and the peasants. And what we need to do is we need to create what they call the dictatorship of the people uh, uh, or, or dictatorship of the proletariat, the workers. And in order to do that, of course, you have to overthrow the existing power structures and replace them with a beautiful society of equality and uh, perfect you know, harmony between everybody, except the bourgeois capitalists who must be destroyed, obviously. Um, and so what they did is they, they created a, a bloody revolution. They killed the czar, the, the royal family, murdered them all, uh, executed them all. Um, and then they began to go after everybody else, the, the so-called capitalists, the so-called aristocrats. The so- and when they ran out of those, the officers in the army, everybody who had some kind of status or power in the pre-existing structure. And when they ran out of those... Uh, one of the things they had to do, of course, is in order for everybody to be equal, you have to take from people who have something and give it to people who don't have anything. And so the kulaks were the supposedly uh, bourgeois exploiters of the working people, whereas mostly they were just wealthy peasants who'd managed to accumulate. You know, for example, in my grandmother's uh, case, they had a horse that was enough for them to be considered wealthy. And therefore, of course, oppressors, this language might be familiar for people in the modern 21st century in the West, uh, they were oppressors. And so their property had to be quite, unquote expropriated uh, and uh, w- because they were evil and had to have everything taken away from them. And so uh, people came to the house with guns, kicked them out of the house, took all their property and exiled them to Siberia. And uh, my grandmother, who was a little girl, remembers her little brother uh begging for food on the way uh, and they didn't have enough food and he starved to death on the way so uh this reordering of society uh and taking the wealthy down a notch as as we like to think about now and making sure that everything is equally distributed and beautiful and perfect uh it com- comes with this sort of uh process um now you'll have to remind me Dan how we got into the kulaks I think it was just giving some context as to what the Soviet experiment was really all about. Mm. You know, this is something that I learned about right. through Solzhenitsyn's work. Yes. And and so you can take it from there. But that, that's yeah. basically an attempt to give an audience that has very little understanding about re, you know recent Soviet history or recent Russian history, what really has, has happened there in the last hundred years or so. Right. So so as part of that process, basically, you reorder society economically, you take from people who have and you redistribute to everybody else. But also you have to put peasants in collective farms where they work for the benefit of the state because you don't have private property in the Soviet Union. Nobody owned anything. Yeah. Uh, if you you were assigned allocated an apartment by the state, uh, you, you were allocated a car if you were lucky to have one by the state. And uh, you'd usually have to wait seven to 10 years to actually get it. You'd get like a notification saying seven years from now, uh, you're going to you're going to get a car and then you'd wait. Um, And one of the problems with that sort of society is essentially what it means is money has no value, really. Like there was money and having more money was better than having less money. But the difference between getting a car 
and not getting a car was not a, not really about money. Almost everyone in the Soviet Union could save up enough money to buy a car, but very few people in the Soviet Union had the pull, the bribes, the connections, mm. the contacts, the, the pull is the right word, to be able to get it. So what it did is it trained people over decades to uh, – it exacerbated the already existing levels of corruption in Russian society to the point – where everything was about who you knew and who you could do a favor to so they could do a favor back to you because you couldn't just go and you know if you had like say you say i give you a million dollars now not that i have a million dollars but let's say i did you can go and buy whatever it is you want right you can go and buy a tesla you can buy some Air jordans you can buy a house whatever it is you want russia wasn't like that you could get a million rubles really wouldn't take you very far because the shops had very little in them Right, you couldn't just go and buy stuff because it was a question of when it would be delivered, and so uh, it, it created this corrupting effect on people's psyche, which I think is present largely to this day. Um, and we could go further and further and further back into Russian history to explain some of some of the psyche. But basically, the Soviet Union was unlike any society you've ever experienced, uh, and it trained people to think very differently about things. Um, and it was an attempt to create equality. Uh, which resulted in, uh, well, it, it sort of, look, I mean, it, it was quite equal in that everybody was equally poor yeah. uh, and equally equally uh, disadvantaged and equally oppressed by the, the system that existed in place. And of course, if you want to keep people artificially equal, that means you have to suppress the natural revolt people feel against an environment in which, say, you work really hard and you're intelligent and I'm a lazy uh, a lazy bastard who doesn't want to do anything and is not particularly bright, but we are supposed to be getting, we work in the same office and our job is the same, our job title is the same and our salary is the same. You're not going to be happy about that, right? And likewise, not everybody wants to live in a totalitarian dictatorship where the government's telling them what to do. And so what it meant was um, during Stalin's period in particular, they had to clear out wave after wave after wave of people who didn't want to live in this totalitarian uh, utopia. Uh, and so that's when they created the gulags, which was, as you know, uh, a large network of essentially prison camps, uh, labor camps, and uh, mostly labor camps. Um, and according to different estimates, you know, millions of people, probably 20 million people went through them. Many, many, many of them died. And as I say, my grandmother was born in one of them because uh, her parents, uh, they were not together at the time. Uh, so her mother, uh, her husband was taken away in the middle of the night, never heard from again. Hmm. Uh, and so she left uh, her child with a neighbor and went to the KGB or whatever it would have been at the time to, to look, to ask after her husband. And the moment she turned up, they imprisoned her as well as a, as a wife of an enemy of the state. So she ended up in, in the camps, uh, her, her husband almost certainly was executed, so he probably didn't even make it to a camp. Uh, and there she met uh, her future husband, my grandmother's father, uh, who was there because he'd happened to be a Polish communist. He came over and they were the ones that were suspect at the time. So this is what Stalin did. He cleared out waves of people based on ethnicity, based on ideology, based on their history, etc. Uh, and so that was the system that was in place that was designed to maintain this completely artificial structure, a system of terror, a system of murder, starvation, forced labor, etc. And that had a huge impact on the psyche of people in Russia and, of course, people in other countries that were part of the Soviet Union. Yeah, you've, you've used this word now twice. And from my perspective, the most informative interview I have watched that has, I think, really helped me understand the Russian psychology is titled The Russian Psyche. It was an interview mm. you did with John Anderson. And you've already alluded to this a little bit about what the lived experience was like for so many Russians in the chaos of the democratic experiment that occurred kind of out of nowhere in the early 90s. And I, I to me, this is why your voice is so important for people in the West, because you are a window into that world <clears throat> now as a, a Westerner yourself. And you tick through a little bit of this already in this conversation. And with John, I would love to give you an opportunity to to maybe tease a little bit of that out of what what it was like 
during that transition. I mean, I, I'm old enough now that to have lived through failed American attempts to impose democracy in the rest of the world that mm. I think has sobered our psyche in terms of what we are capable of in the world and what what is reasonable to try to achieve. But I think this helps to understand our current situation in, in many ways of the, the loyalty to somebody like Vladimir Putin and, and the approval that he still seems to have. Obviously, the media is a component of this, which you've talked about in terms of, I think, something like 80% of of Russians getting their news information from television and not from Twitter mm. and not from the internet. But if we can maybe start there about what you remember, what you know about what that experiment, the dabbling in, in democracy was like, and the terror and the chaos that that really brought to mm. an entire civilization. Well, you, you, I think it's important to distinguish between what happened in Russia and democracy. Yeah. Uh, what happened in Russia was not the product of an experiment with democracy. What happened in Russia was the product of the breakdown of, a, of an existing system and the attempt to introduce another system. I, I don't think it was the flaws of democracy that caused things to be the, the way the way that they are. Uh, I would argue it was the the rapid immediate shift from one system to another. I think if you think about um, you know a revolution, for example, which is essentially the equivalent, right? Uh, the previous regime collapses and is replaced by a new one, usually they're a lot more bloody and a lot more painful than what happened in Russia in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, and that change of regime and, and type of government will always produce a lot of chaos. Um, but basically, the way I like to do this, I just ask you as, a, as an audience member to imagine that you are uh, an ordinary person living in the Soviet Union, you're, you're quite poor, uh, you're certainly very unfree by Western standards, but because of the Iron Curtain and because we didn't have access to any Western media uh, in 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 the Soviet Union. In fact, uh, my other grandfather, who was arrested for um, being a dissident in the late Soviet Union, one of his greatest crimes was that he had a radio uh, receiver that could be used to listen to the Voice of America, BBC, World Service, etc. This was all banned. This yeah. was like uh, what happens in China, where there's certain things you can't Google, but much more so. You didn't even have the internet, obviously, in those days. So it was a closed society with a complete lack of information. So you don't know that you're poor and you don't know that you are unfree. I mean, you know you're not free, but you don't know how that compares to elsewhere. You keep being told that these evil uh, you know, capitalist pig dogs over there are up to no good and whatever, and that's all you know. So you're living a poor, unfree life, but it's very stable. Every day, the same as the next. You know that if you do the right thing, then you, you're going to have a job. And if your children, your son does the right thing, he's going to have a job. And if your daughter does the right thing, she's going to go to school. And then she's going to go to college. And then she, she's going to get a job. And the government will take care of her. And there's no unemployment in society because everyone is given a job by the state. And if she's lucky or if he's lucky, they're going to get an apartment and, and blah, 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 blah. And if they have kids, there will be uh, a state funded childcare facility for them to go to from the age of like a few months, as was the case with me. Um, so, 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 and, you know, healthcare isn't, is, is pretty atrocious, but, but, but it's there, like it's available to you. Everybody gets healthcare. So that society exists and you, you're fine. And maybe you're even doing well. Maybe you've got some savings stashed away uh, enough to see you through a rainy day, et cetera. And then overnight, the society collapses uh, and your savings are gone overnight. Your job is gone overnight. Uh, your son gets shipped off to, to fight some war in a place in a part of so-called Russia that you never heard of called Chechnya. Uh, your daughter, as I alluded to earlier, you know, if she doesn't have enough money, she could well become a prostitute. Um, your own life prospects are very unclear. Suddenly, there's an awful lot of violent crime, uh, both organized crime fighting each other over control and racketeering of businesses, etc. But also just there's thugs hanging outside in the streets, harassing people uh, that, that never would have happened in the Soviet Union at all. Uh, people around you are dying from drug overdoses, alcohol abuse. Uh, there's an awful lot of you know social disease going on overnight. Uh, 
And uh, to compound all of this, the very people who used to be the scum of the previous society, the criminals, uh, the murderers, the organized crime who were the lowest of the low and 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 massively disrespected, they suddenly acquire access to all the riches of this new beautiful society. Uh, they somehow end up controlling huge amounts of wealth and capital while you struggle to make ends meet. And as I say, your children are if you know fighting in a war or selling their body for sex somewhere so um the 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 transformation was shocking to most people and of course i'm not suggesting that every person had this exact experience but almost every person knew someone who had one of these experiences someone whose son was shipped off to chechnya or someone whose daughter fell victim to the sex trade or someone who who'd been beaten up in the street or or, or whatever it might have been Right. Uh, so th- that collapse was deeply, deeply painful. And of course, I'm not even talking about the, the overall economic situation uh, in 1998. This isn't early 90s. This is after several, you know, after seven years of, of the new democratic Russia. Inflation in 1998 uh, it, after a financial crisis was 84 percent. Right. We may get there this year in the West <laughs> if we carry on at this rate. But it was bad. It was really, really bad. And then add to that. Uh, the threat of terrorism, which resulted from the war in Chechnya or from the situation in Chechnya, more accurately, to the point where at one uh, stage, a group of terrorists uh, got on a, on a couple of buses or maybe just one bus, drove from Chechnya into Russia, main, the main country of Russia, entered a small city, uh, rounded up over a thousand innocent people into a hospital, uh, killed anyone who tried to stop them or got in their way or refused to comply held uh, these people hostage. Uh, the, the Russian secret security services tried to storm the, the hospital building over and over and over with no effect other than killing a bunch of hostages and losing a lot of their own men. Um, and eventually, the prime minister of Russia, Viktor Chernomyrdin, negotiated with these terrorists. And that negotiation led to a ceasefire in Chechnya. So Russia, the Soviet Union, a country with a huge nuclear arsenal which was feared around the world whose strength was undisputed the first man to, the first country to send a man into space one of the two superpowers in the world yesterday today that country is surrendering to terrorists yeah right that was a huge psychological shock to most people and so uh, by the time uh, by the time that vladimir putin came around in 1999 people were begging begging for someone to come and stop it make it stop that's what people wanted they want and they didn't care about fr- you know freedom or human rights or any of that crap they wanted this out- utter devastation and chaos to end uh, and that's why when they realize that vladimir putin is going to be someone who does that um they 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 were reasonably happy now of course you can't talk for all Russians in every society. There's people with different views. A lot of people weren't happy about him coming to power because, uh, of course, the terrible things I describe are true, but there was also other things going on. There was a, a liberalization of the press. There was a liberalization of comedy for the first time probably in Russian history. Uh, you could make fun of the president on TV. You could have satirical comedy shows. Uh, there was a genuine emergence of a free press. People could write stories about corruption and expose things. Th- these, these things were also happening. Uh, Russia was moving into, into sort of the Western society to the extent that it was doing trade. And we got a lot of Western goods uh, that previously people had no access to. So yes, you were poor and society was terrible, but also there was a, there were good things going on as well. So there was, there were different sides to it. But for the most part, a lot of people felt, uh, you know, Boris Yeltsin, who oversaw this period, had a very low approval rating. I think by the time the 90s were over, he had like a 3% approval rating. Mm. Uh, and uh, people were begging for, for a strongman leader. And we can get into why Russians love a strongman leader. That's another historical lecture. Um, you know, uh, they were begging for a strong strongman leader to come in and sort it out. And Vladimir Putin is widely seen in Russia as having done that. Yeah. And as you mentioned, yes, in the wake of this chaos, up comes this upstart former KGB agent thug Mm. who ascends to the highest level of political power in the country. And obviously that has that figure has dominated world news for the last five months, most of this year. Do you know how he came to power, Dan? 
a little bit, but I would love to hear you tell that story. Well, it's an interesting story, not least because it's going to have to be repeated pretty soon. So what happened uh, in, in the 90s was Boris Yeltsin, the first president of this new Russia, uh, of course, under his watch, all sorts of terrible crimes, bribery, embezzlement, corruption were committed, his so-called family. Uh, you know, and that just that's not just him. It's and, and his immediate actual biological family was the clan, if you like, the, the the Yeltsin clan. They were in charge of a tremendous amount of all the, the corruption and embezzlement and bribery that was going on. So, as Boris Yeltsin was getting old, he was an alcoholic. His health was uh, completely ruined by this point. What he needed to do was to find somebody who did not already have power who was not already somebody that he could hand the power over to and say, look, you were nobody. You had no power. You had no money. You had no, uh, you know, anything. I am going to make you the most powerful man in, in this great, big, gigantic country. And in exchange, what I want is safety. Yeah. I want to be safe. I want you to keep my family safe. I want you to make sure no one comes after me for all the terrible things that I and my clan have done. And that's why Vladimir Putin was a complete unknown, because if he'd given power to somebody who was already part, part of the political power structure, the very first thing they would have done is gone after him and his family, put him in prison, because there would have been very good reasons to put him in prison. Um, because anyone who rises to the top in Russia, by the very design of the system, is going to be corrupt, is going to be complicit in all sorts of terrible things. So Vladimir Putin was like an insurance policy that uh, Boris Yeltsin took. And of course, Vladimir Putin is facing this dilemma soon. There's some rumors that he's perhaps not well, uh, et cetera, but he needs to ensure the transition. Uh, and so he tried this with uh, Dmitry, Dmitry Medvedev initially, uh, and it turned out Medvedev isn't really strong enough to hold the country. And so now Medvedev has been relegated uh, and Putin is back as president. Um, and uh, they changed the constitution so Putin could be elected for more longer terms, etc. So Putin was an insurance policy. And now, you know, he came to power in 1999. He's been in power for nearly 23 years years now. And of course, as you say, not only we in the West, not very well educated about Soviet history, very few people uh, in the West understand what Russia is today. Uh, a lot of people in the West sort of run around with this uh, very sweet idea that Russia is some kind of, you know, quasi democracy, which I find quite amusing. Um, uh, and uh, that's really, again, a product of that lack of understanding of what's happening in Russia. So Vladimir Putin comes to power in 99. Uh, initially, he spent the first few years trying to consolidate the economy, which he did uh, pretty well, aided by you know uh, very high oil prices, which of course helps Russia tremendously. Um, and you know he's seen as he he ends the war in Chechnya. He he he's tough on terrorism. He stabilizes the country. He nationalizes corruption. Corruption was privatized before you had all these oligarchs running around Roman Abramovich and Khodorkovsky and all of these other people, uh, you know, Boris Berezovsky, all these people run, running around, you know, trying to be powerful, you know, independent, trying to control things, trying to fund opposition parties. Well, Vladimir Putin comes in and ends all that. He says, you know, we don't want criminality. We need order. So what he does is he nationalizes the corruption. So a Russian oligarch is no longer an independent criminal stroke businessman who made it in the 90s. A Russian oligarch now is an appointed position. He is a, he's a, an, an appointee in the civil service of Russia, right? You get assigned. If you are part of the team, the Putin team, there's about 50 or 60 people who are right at the top. You get you are now the aluminium oligarch, or you are now the nickel oligarch, you are now the oil shipping oligarch or whatever. And you are that as long as you are loyal and needed by the team. And so in that sense, at that level, there is no private property in Russia because the moment you stop being useful, you no longer have anything. And even if you you're not somebody who's been assigned oligarchy, you are actually an independent businessman who ever who refused to cooperate in these bribes and all of that. Like uh, Tinkoff, this was a, a big company in Russia. He fled Russia after making some critical comments of Vladimir Putin in the last few months. Uh, and uh, he was forced to sell his company at like 2% of its 
actual value. So private property above the ordinary person's ownership of their flat or apartment or, or car doesn't really exist in Russia at that level. It's all been nationalized. It's all controlled by the person at the very top. Yeah. Thank you for giving that that um, that background of the of the state of affairs because you know in that context you are growing up and you are mm. moving to the west and so much of I think what your book is going to be about and your own you know your, your own desire I would imagine to do the work you do is about beliefs and ideas and values mm. and I'm wondering for you as you as you said, you, you're going to a UK boarding school. Your, your life is moving to the West. Your parents are making sacrifices for you to mm-hmm. get out. What did you begin to notice about the West? And I, I want to bring this to modern times fairly quickly in terms of the, the work you have done in the last five or so years, right? You're in media primarily. I mean, mm-hmm. at first you were a comedian, which as you know, and as we were talking about before this conversation started, I, I view them as some of the most interestingly important people in our society because of the honesty that can be spoken oftentimes in, in comedic settings that isn't permissible in, in modern mm. media. You go from comedy and now you're in, in the media. There's a lot that's happened in your life it, during those years, I'm sure, but what in general did you begin to notice about the West, both that you personally became deeply committed to and thought really mattered? Mm. And, and what were you noticing in the society or the media that was probably just upsetting you that you felt? I know I've heard you say this in other interviews that we are taking for granted and we are doing own goals on our civilization that mm. are are hemorrhaging at the very foundation, the very inheritance that we have, that we have obtained from many generations. So there's a lot that I just posited there and stated there, but mm. how do you make sense of that for, for yourself? What, what did you begin to notice and what kind of values you know, still deeply resonate to you that you're trying to remind people and wake people up that actually matter about this great inheritance that, that we mm. have? It's a really, really good question, Dan. So the, the first, there's, I would say there's two primary things that we, we uh, ought to focus on here. The first is when I first came to boarding school, I spoke with Russian accent like this, so <laughs> kids would make fun of me. Uh, and I would get very upset about this, and, and I'd go, you know, I'd tell them to shut up or whatever, and they'd go, it's a free country. And I was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. You know, and this idea that actually people can say things that you might not find pleasant uh, and you might not like, but you live in a society where people have the freedom to say things that other people don't like. Uh, That was something that I learned straight away. And actually, uh, after the initial shock, it it seemed to me like a good idea and, and one which I later came to realize that serves as the foundation of everything else. You, you don't get uh, scientific progress of the type and technological progress of the type that the West has been able to have without uh, freedom of speech and freedom of enterprise and, and the freedom for people to start their own business and uh, not have to pay bribes and uh, follow rules that are made by other people who just want to have a slice of their action as opposed to trying to you know just regula- regulate business. Um, So the idea of freedom and freedom of expression and freedom of uh, pursuit was very important. And of course, you know, the history of my family as I was growing up, I'd be speaking to my grandparents about their experiences and realizing that actually what happened in the Soviet Union and in Russia was not normal. It's not normal that people should be put in camps for their beliefs in the 20th century. It's not actually a normal thing to happen. Uh, And that the Western world operates and operated, has operated for quite some time on a very different idea, which is, you know, of course, you know, you get the the witch trials and the sailor and all of that, and people get accused of things and whatever. But generally speaking, the idea is that as long as you're not inciting violence against other people, uh, you are free to speak your mind. And, and we may think you're a complete idiot, but we nonetheless respect your right to speak your mind. Uh, and that to me seems like a foundational piece of the Western puzzle, which I certainly feel that it has been under threat in recent years. Um, so that that's, I would say, uh, 
um, the first part of the puzzle and the second one now escapes me. Uh, but the free speech idea is, is a very, very important one. Um, I've forgotten what I was going to say. It's, it's a second part that I think is really important about what we have in the West as well. But I was particularly struck by uh, by this idea that we all are free to speak our minds. And, and I thought that seeing that was a problem. And now, of course, I remember what I was going to say, which is uh, I talk about this in the book. And I know that having watched my interview with John Anderson, you'll know the answer to this question. But most people don't. Most people don't know where political correctness actually yeah. comes from. Right. And they don't know that it comes from the Russian Re Russian Revolution, the Soviet Union. And it had nothing ever to do with not offending people, being polite, respecting people's pronouns or whatever it is. It had nothing to do with that. It was always about one thing and one thing only, which was enforcing the party line, right? It was about getting you to shut up because what you were saying was contrary to what the party wanted you to believe. And that's where political correctness comes from. And so when I see this attempt to implement this in the West, I'm deeply troubled because this is part of the, the same process of eroding our freedom of speech and our freedom of expression. And we're doing this by picking up the worst elements of our enemy civilization, if you like, because the Soviet Union was absolutely an enemy of the West. There's no question about it. There's no debate. It was an enemy both in terms of how the country behaved, but it was also an enemy ideologically. The, the, the mentality and the political structure of the Soviet Union was anathema, and it was completely antithetical to the Western project. So to see the West take these things on is deeply troubling. Now, troubling as that is, I actually think there's the second part of what I was going to say, which is troubles me even more, Dan, which is I think the West is, is playing with some very dangerous ideas. We're playing with some very dangerous ideas that have also been tried uh, in the Soviet Union and elsewhere historically. And this is the idea that some people are better than others. Uh, or some people more appropriately, in this case, are worse than others. And I don't mean some people are better at basketball than others, or some people make better cooks than others, or some people are better politicians than others, or better bankers or whatever. I don't mean that different groups have different aptitudes, and this means that there's differences. I'm talking about the sort of system that you had at the foundation of the United States, uh, the idea that a person, because of the color of their skin, for example, is only worth three-fifths of, of a vote, uh, or that a person who has a different skin color has the full vote, right? Um, this idea that some people are morally better than others, that, that they are more deserving of things than others, that they should be given opportunities instead of other people who are equally meritorious, but just happen to have some different characteristics. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, you guys tried it 200 years ago, and you moved away from it quite quickly after a very bloody civil war. Uh, and it is an idea that's been tried very thoroughly around the world with very, very consistent outcomes that I wouldn't wish on anyone. And in doing so, we are playing with, with fire. We are playing with absolute fire. You see that racial groups are being antagonized against each other in a way that I think is very ill-advised. Um, and the problem is that, you know, I think there was there was certain tr waves of feminism because there were waves of feminism, which I think were very important, but there was other ways of feminism, more recent ones, that sort of operated from the basis that, um, you know, what we really need is a battle of the sexes, that, you know, men are bad, women are good, men have been evil for a long time, and we need to just, you know, put them back in the box. Um, and that didn't work, really. I mean, like, you still see some people who think that way, but it didn't really work because men and women are naturally drawn to each other for obvious reasons. We are drawn to each other uh, for romantically, we're drawn to each other practically. You know, if you want to raise a child, as my wife and I are desperately struggling to do right now, we're like it really helps to have two people doing it, right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it's not a fashionable thing to say, but statistically speaking, it's pretty good if those people are from the opposite sexes uh, because it gives the child an opportunity to see different how different sexes operate, what the right relationship should be between them, etc. So women and men, yeah, you can divide them for a time, but you can't really do that permanently. It's not hardwired into our brains to, for men to, to, you know, be suspicious of women. That's not to say men have always treated women well. Yeah. Uh, I certainly wouldn't argue that. But 
I, I don't think this antagonism that they tried to create between men and women, that was never going to last, right? The problem with other uh, things that we are doing now, particularly along racial and ethnic lines, is that actually human beings are pretty hardwired on that stuff to be prejudiced, to be suspicious, to other other people, to suspect them of something uh you know, dark and dangerous. And the the evidence is all there in terms of uh, how people behave in certain situations. So, uh, and I, I felt that while, of course, neither American nor British society had got to the great utopia where we don't see each other's color at all and there's no differences between different ethnic groups, if ever that was going to be achievable in the first place, what we were doing is we'd found the right approach. The right approach being the one articulated by Martin Luther King, which is the idea that we should be treated by the content of our character and that your skin color or your sexuality or uh, your sex, these are not things that should determine how other people treat you or how you see yourself, but rather that we should live in a society where those things do not matter for the purposes of how we treat each other. Uh, now, I think we're moving not only away from that, I think we're moving in the opposite direction. And that approach, if taken to its logical conclusion, has only one end, and it's not a good one. Yeah. And that's why I wrote the book, because I am deeply concerned that what is happening now, well-intentioned as it may be, certainly among some people, I don't think it leads to a good place, and it's not the society that I want my children to grow up in. I don't want my children to grow up in a society where, once again, people are judged not on the content of their character, but are indeed judged uh, on the color of their skin. I don't want that. And some of the rhetoric in recent years makes me feel that, you know, we're, we're moving in that direction, and it's really, really not healthy. Yeah. I, I know I have heard you say this in prior interviews, that it, your real concern is the pushback to this, right? It, it's it's what could happen if this, you know, especially related to race, gets mm. pushed far enough that you know. I, I think I've heard you say that you know, you don't you don't agree obviously with with the leftist line on this, but you know, we we know enough history to be, we should know enough history to be rightly concerned about what the right wing pushback to this might look like. Yeah. And look, by the way, you know, I'm not saying this because I'm on the right or I'm on the left. I really don't think of myself as, as on either of those sides. And this idea that some people are better than others and some people are worse than others has been tried by both left and right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason that my great grandfather died fighting the Nazis was that there were some people in Germany who wanted to try that idea from a racial superiority position but also the other reason he died in that war was there were some people in his country who wanted to try it from a workers versus capitalist position. There's always been on both sides and in different countries, in different tribal groups, in different religious groups, etc., attempts to try this. And some of it has been political and some of it has been religious, ethnic, whatever you want to call it. So to me, there's no difference between... Um, you know, the ethnic cleansing we saw in Europe or in Rwanda or any of that. It's not really about left and right. It's about instilling in people that the belief that some people are worse than others by virtue of who, how they were born. Um, and I don't care how well-intentioned you are. I don't care if you're a well-meaning leftist or you're a racial supremacist, far-right person. It doesn't really make any difference. Once you go down the path of telling people that some of them are better than others, some of them are worse than others, you're heading in the wrong direction as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. There are some quotes that uh, I've written down that, that you have made before that I think tie into exactly what we're talking about that it might be helpful to read out. And some of this, I think, just from my perspective, I, I bet you would agree with this, is to give people just sort of a values-driven, ethical North Star for what we are trying to to, ch to achieve and and where it might be helpful to set our horizons. And th this is related to the subject that we're just talking about. And this is from you. We need to get back to Martin Luther King's dream where people are, tre are treated on the content of their character, not their skin color and not their political viewpoints. Something you just mentioned. A few other ones that I want to read out here. And we touched on just truth in general. And I, I love this line. Uh, this is a Thomas Sowell line that I think you like as well. Thomas Sowell has this, this is me quoting you again. 
Thomas Sowell has this great quote. When you want to help other people, you generally tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. So you have to make that decision for yourself. This goes on this again from you. I can tell you there's nothing worse than not speaking your mind when you know what the truth is. The material benefits of not doing that, are they worth it? Well, that's for you to weigh up. And it depends on, the, on what the material benefits are. There's a great quote from Fight Club. It's only once you've lost everything that you're free to do anything. If you have nothing, it is very easy to say what you think. If you have a lot to lose, that's where the problems start. I want to read one other quote that you have, which I absolutely loved and would love to get your, your comments on it. And th- this is related to the inheritance aspect of this conversation, which you talked to John about, and it immediately resonated with me. And it's, it's something I wanted to, to also read out during this conversation. And this is, again, me quoting you. And you, you say this country during this quote, which is England, but I think it, it might be interchangeable with the West in general. And this is you. I'm an outsider here. I, I'm sorry. I'm not an outsider here to tell you how to run your country and run your life. I'm one of you now. I'm here and my children are going to live in this country. And that's why I care deeply about what's going to happen in this society. So mm-hmm. all, I'm trying to remi- all I'm trying to do is remind people of the things that underpin the values, the freedoms, the prosperity that we enjoy here. They didn't fall out of the sky. They come from centuries of ideological discussions, of war. People, who, people have bled to make this country as prosperous and as free as it is. And I think we owe it to ourselves to not forget that and to, rem- to remember the value of everything that's been created here. If you could, I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak to that specifically. And you know, I know we're getting slightly short on time at this point in the conversation. We can do a little bit longer. We can do another 10, 15 minutes. It's fine. Okay. Okay, great. To that point specifically, and it, it just personally, it has deeply troubled me just in the US how, and this is not news to anyone, how polarized people have become, the, mm. the prominence of political conversation in everything and that the the esteem and the importance that's given to one's political tribalism arguably is is number one in so many people uh in this civilization in a way that i I don't think it was when i was a kid Mm. and you when i hear your work and i you you already talked about this during this conversation you know you, you have lived in on park benches you have gone to private boarding schools you've seen different civilizations to the west you've lived a difficult life in the west at times and and now have a successful media operation but the to me what you it seems like what you are trying to do is to remind people to focus people on the threat that you are, you said this earlier, that, that we are playing with fire with some of these games. And to read out that quote one more time, the one that you said to, to John, and that we owe it to ourselves to not forget and to remember the value of everything that's been created here. You've mentioned a little bit about what that is to you, what that means to you. What else? about the West. You, we've talked about freedom of speech. Uh, we've talked about the, the differences in, in freedom in general between what the to- totalitarian state was like for Soviet citizens versus what we in the West kind of understandably take for granted. Mm. What else is it that you are trying to remind people from your vantage point that we have here that is not normal or at least is not valued in other civilizations that are attempting to come for us Right. Mm. This is something I remember hearing you say the day of or the day after the invasion was that it's not all sunshine and rainbows out there. And there are countries of hundreds of millions of people who do not think like we do, who do not value individual rights in the way that we do. Mm. You can take that and run with it in whatever way you would like. If anything resonates, you might like to add to that conversation in general. Well, actually, Dan, I think you hit hit the nail on the head with that last point. I think 
first and foremost, the first thing we should try to remind people of is, yes, in the West, we all want to trade and live peacefully ever after, and we don't want to go to war. Look, uh, some of our elites sometimes want to go to war, as we talked about earlier with trying to supposedly build democracy and not, not sure that's what they were actually trying to do. But, um, you know, that happens, but it's not the same as, as what we're talking about. Nobody in the West wants to invade Russia. Nobody in the West wants to invade China. Um, but in other countries, uh, the, the the perception of the West is very different. The West is seen as, and when I say the West, I really mean America particularly, yeah. as seen as this evil hegemony that's taking advantage of everybody else that's oppressing everybody else that's that's how people see it and so uh if you felt that you were living in a world that was run by an evil hegemonic power from which you don't benefit how would you feel about that and what would you want to do in that society uh the the foreign minister of russia the chinese leadership the the vladimir putin they've all talked about this repeatedly this is why they keep banging on about a multipolar world what they mean is we don't want you to be powerful we want to be powerful ourselves and by the way that's an understandable position I, i'm not saying i support what they're doing i really really don't as you well know but i think it would behoove us in the west to realize that is a natural product of the fact that we're king of the hill. People will come for us. Um, and you've got to remember, for example, for our American listeners, uh, that the United States is 5% of the world's population and consumes 25% of the world's resources. Now, how do you think the rest of the world feels about that? Right? So the first thing I think people need to understand is... Uh, you know, this idea, when I was at university here in the UK, uh, the th and I was studying politics the, and geopolitics, the thing that we were all told as young undergraduates was, well, guys, there's this golden arches theory uh, of geopolitics, which is that no two countries have, that have a McDonald's have ever gone to war. Well, that theory is no longer true, right? And the reason it's not true is that, yes, a lot of countries have benefited from international trade, but that isn't the only thing that people care about. There are some people uh, who are driven by personal delusions of grandeur. There are others who are driven by imperialism. There are others who are driven by ideology. There are others who are driven by a deep sense of resentment. There are others who are driven among those things. They're also, including those things, they're also driven by other things like the need to explain their own just their own existence to their own people right this is one of the the reasons that russian media bombards the russian populace with endless propaganda about how literally the west is about to invade the west is getting ready to nuke russia this is literally what they say on tv every day in russia the west is about to attack america is about to drop weapons they were about to give ukraine the new the nuclear bomb etc why because we know it's not true they know it's not true so why do they think this well the reason or why do they say this rather the reason they say this is think about it from a a russian leadership perspective uh during the early 90s uh, Russia under Boris Yeltsin made overtures, overtures to the West and the West made overtures to Russia. I remember as a kid in a Russian school uh, getting cans of spam that was American humanitarian aid. By the way, Russia was not, not defeated in war, right? It wasn't a country that was on the brink of collapse. Well, the Americans were sending, you know, uh, this spam me. And also there was a uh, there was a time when we received huge numbers of chicken legs from the United States, and they were called Bush's legs, Noshki Busha, because he was the one, it was Bush Sr. who oversaw that humanitarian aid program. So there was more cooperation. And if there's cooperation between Russia and the West, if there's trade, if everything's wonderful, the question that people start to ask is, well, why do we need a brutal, murdering, authoritarian dictator that can never be replaced at the ballot box. Wouldn't wouldn't it be better if we had someone a bit more liberal? Wouldn't it be better if we had someone who would also give us, you know, a free press and and a, uh, you know we could have comedy shows that can make fun of stuff and we didn't feel like we were regressing back into the Soviet Union in terms of censorship and what we can and can't say, etc. Well, if people start to get these unfortunate notions, the best way to explain to them why they need you 
is to present them with an external threat or force that can only be defeated by a strong man leader. That's me. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of this propaganda, that's where it's coming from. Uh, and it's done knowingly and it maps onto a lot of pre-existing sort of historical trauma in the Russian mindset and the Russian psyche uh, about being invaded. If you look at the map of Russia, 80% of the Russian population lives in about 20% of the westernmost part of the country, uh, which is mostly plains. There's no large mountain ranges. There's no deep rivers. There's no natural obstacles to an invasion. And of course, Russia has been invaded over and over and over and over and decimated by those invasions, whether that was Hitler or Napoleon before him or the Mongols before them and or the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Swedes and the Finns. It's happened over and over and over again. So the fear of a foreign threat is there. And you can capitalize on that by presenting yourself as the only solution to these evil invaders who are about to come. So uh, people will want to challenge the West supremacy for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and they're doing it right now. Uh, because this was always going to happen. So that's the first thing I think we need to realize. The other thing, I gave a talk recently here in the UK it, it, um, about why the West needs to uh, re-examine its own relationship with itself. Uh, and I quoted a man who was, uh, he actually wasn't the ambassador to the Soviet Union, but he worked in the, in the American embassy to the Soviet Union, uh, a man called George Kennan. And he was basically the architect of the Western policy of containment of the Soviet Union. And one of the things he said, uh, he, he, um, he, he wrote something called The Long Telegram, which I really invite everybody to read. And in it, he talked about the fact that the greatest threat to the West is that we become like the enemy we are fighting. And the only answer that we have is to cling to our own methods of conception and conceptions of society. Right. We have to embrace our own values. Otherwise, we will become like the very people who will oppose us. Uh, and that is why I'm concerned about the rise of identity politics. That is why I'm concerned about the endless shouting about egalitarianism and e equity and all of this other stuff. And that's why I'm concerned about the rise of political correctness, because I see in that an embrace of ideas that are deeply foreign and deeply hostile to the Western project. It is not what America was built on. It is not what Britain was built on. The idea of equality of outcome is not something that Britain or America have ever embraced and is not something that they should ever embrace because it doesn't work. Because in every country that has tried communism, which is what equality of outcome actually means, uh, the outcome hasn't been a brilliant utopia for the people. What it has been is a brutal totalitarian dictatorship, mass starvation, mass murder, usually war, chaos, and death, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't want that, I think we it behooves us to stay away from some of these ideas and to strengthen our own values in ourselves. And I think one of the reasons that we are seeing this polarization that you're so concerned with, Dan, as I am, is, of course, technology. Technology has enabled us to go online and say all the stupid shit that we wouldn't normally say to each other, but we can now say it online and be seen by millions of people. But also, if you undermine our conception of ourselves as being part of the nation state, if you say to people, well, you know, America's evil, Britain is evil, we're not good people we're bad people, then people don't really want to be associated with that. They don't want to think of themselves as Americans anymore or as Brits anymore or as Westerners anymore. They'd much rather think of themselves as, you know, a black transgender lesbian who's in opposition to this evil society in which they happen to have been born, right? For some reason, the black transgender lesbians who are deeply upset with American society never move to countries like Russia or China or countries in Africa or in the Middle East, perhaps because they know what would happen to them there. But nonetheless, while they're in America, they're able to maintain the pretense that their society is uniquely evil and worse than any other. And so this is a problem because that's where a lot of the polarization comes from. If we don't have a common identity to buy into, right? Which is the American idea, if you think about it. The American idea is, we don't care. I don't know Dan Riley. I don't know what your, your, your parents are probably Irish or grandparents are probably Irish or whatever they might have been, right? And, I, and if I come to America and settle down, well, I, I'm, some people will call me a Russian American, right? But the point is, the end of that, 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 those two words is American, right? You are American. I'm American. The thing that unites us is that we're American rather than that you're Irish and I'm Russian, right? Right? rather than I'm this and that. At the end of the day, 
We all come together, and that means that we buy into a set of ideas about what it means to be an American, what it means to be British. Uh, and the moment you take that away, yeah, then we do retreat into our own individual skin colors and genders and sexualities and whatever, and then we're divided and we're not prepared for the threats that we face. Yeah. My favorite Russian historian, I bet you know this guy's name, Stephen Kotkin, who's mm. a professor at Princeton, absolutely brilliant mind and amazingly eloquent. I have heard him address the polarization problem multiple times in interviews. And his general take while recognizing the threats that exist in the world to America, to him, he isn't particularly worried about them. He recognizes them. What does worry him, I've heard him say, is exactly what you just said. Um, what worries That's what I'm saying it then. I mean, <laughs> you, look, let, let's be honest. You clearly are a smart guy. I'd like to think I'm a smart guy. I'm neither of us probably as smart as Stephen Kotkin. He's a smart guy. Like, you don't have to be a smart guy to understand this. Empires and powerful countries and societies, they don't collapse because some crappy little barbarian turns up at the gates and tries to attack. Right. You can only be defeated in war if you're weak. You can only be defeated in economic competition if you're weak and divided. Right. So the threat to us is never external. It's always internal because we are the strongest, strongest ideological grouping in the world, political grouping in the world, diplomatic grouping in the world, military grouping in the world. You've got to understand NATO is way more powerful than China or Russia militarily. Right. The only thing that can threaten us is us. And that's why this division is so deeply divisive. And that's why I wrote this, because people need to understand there's a reason to respect what we are. There's a reason to love who we are. There's a reason to appreciate what we are. Because if we don't, there are other people around the world who are not busy spending their time arguing what a woman is, right? They're getting ready to come and take over. Yeah. Yeah. While being critical of our own history, right? I mean, that, that is the beauty 100%. Of, the, of the system. Well, accurate. I don't think we need to be critical. I think we need to be accurate because this is the thing, right? Like, look, look at American history, British history. There's so much to criticize, isn't there? Slavery, imperialism, genocide, you know, the spreading of disease, colonialism, all these things. Okay, they are all terrible. What were other countries around the world doing at that time? What were other civilizations doing at that time? This is what I talk about in chapter three of my book about slavery. And I put it in context. Thomas Sowell, who you mentioned, Orlando Patterson, a Jamaican, uh, I think he's an historian, anthropologist, he's a bunch of things, right? Sociologist, I think mostly. He wrote a book called Slavery and Social Death. They talk about the fact that, you know, when we think about slavery, we immediately think of the transatlantic slave trade. Well, guess what? At exactly that same time, M Middle East and Arab slave traders were taking Africans out of Africa in greater numbers. The death rates were higher, and they only stopped, Dan, because the West made them, mm. right? So we've got to, yes, absolutely, let's teach all of that stuff. Let's talk about slavery. Let's talk about colonialism. These are important things, and they are undoubtedly foundations of certainly your society. We can't deny them. We can't pretend they didn't exist, but they've got to be understood in context. Right. Human beings were the first good that was ever traded by other human beings. They were the first thing that was traded. Right. Human beings have been enslaved in every society that's ever existed, ever. What, what, and and, and the, the point I make in that chapter in the book is like, imagine as if you need to, 30 or 40 years from now, the vegans get their way. Right. And eating meat is considered this abominable thing that's as bad as enslaving a fellow human being. And let's say Britain, America, and Western European countries get together and we ban the meat trade, we abolish the murder and systemic torture of animals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we encourage and eventually force other countries to do it. Would it be fair or reasonable in that situation to say that we, the people who ended this first and who helped and encouraged and forced others to do so as well, we are the worst people in the world on this issue? Or would we conclude that actually we are some of the most progressive societies? And while, of course, we regret the terrible things that our forefathers did, we are now better than that. We've moved on while many, many other countries haven't, right? And that, of course, we can continue to improve race relations and we can continue to make sure that people who were disenfranchised or disadvantaged get a fair shot. I'm all about people having a fair shot, right? If you come from a community that's impoverished, you do not have a fair shot 
in our society today. I talk about this in the book as well. I talk about the huge problems that are caused by the housing crisis uh, in the UK. The fact that young people can't buy a home, which is really, really important to moving up the ladder. I talk about wealth inequality. I talk about social mobility. I'm, see, people will listen to this and go, oh, this is this right wing crazy guy. I'm not. I just I'm trying to tell people the truth. Because as you said, quoting Thomas Sowell, I'm trying to help right? I don't want it. To, it's very easy for me. I could come in and go, oh, I've got dark skin. I'm a first generation in, immigrant. I'm oppressed. Let me help you, you know, understand how deeply racist your society is. I'm not interested in that because that doesn't help us. It doesn't make society better for you, for me, for our children and their children. What helps us is being honest. So yes, we've got to teach history, but history means teaching it in context. Yeah. You want to talk about slavery? Okay. What was happening in the Russian Empire at the time? What was happening in the Ottoman Empire in the time? Who, by the way, Dan, did the enslaving of Black Africans in Africa? Was it Western Europeans? Turns out it wasn't if you do some research. And I don't recommend people look into this, right? Slavery had been prevalent in Africa for centuries by the time the Europeans got there. Europeans didn't even get off the boats because it was so dangerous for them because of all the, the tropical diseases that were there. Right. The the death rate, I mean, um, this doesn't excuse slavery, of course, but the death rate on slave ships for Western colonials was as high as it was for the slaves themselves. Right. So the, it's not like the Western powers came to this place and introduced this evil institution. It was a thing that everybody did since forever. You know, I love going to the south of Italy, for example. I try to go every year. And in Sicily, there's all sorts of temples, some of them built by the ancient Greeks, some of them built by the ancient Romans, some of them built by the ancient Carthaginians. Who do you think built them? Hmm. Contractors? Right? So this is a universal institution through, 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 through the human society. But how many people could tell you that now? How many of these people who run around telling you about the evils of colonialism could understand what was happening in Native American societies when it comes to slavery. Right? Yeah. We, I agree with you. We have to have proper historical education, but it's got to be contextual. Otherwise, you don't understand anything. Yeah. We are storytelling animals, and we need accurate stories that are truthful and uniting and proud, I think, of a lot of what our civilization is is based upon and i, I want to close with two separate subjects the first is comedy which i know you and i both love you actually are a comedian and as you were just saying what you said one of my favorite lines came to mind which is i don't know if you know the comedian mark norman but in my mind he's one of the most brilliant american comedians who i i recently saw live and his his throwaway line was the new N-word is nuance, mm. which I thought was such a pithy, accurate assessment of the world that we inhabit today. Mm. I want to read a quote from you, two quotes from you, the first about comedy and the second about the future. Um, this is the one about comedy. This is me quoting you. Comedy is downstream of culture. So the job of comedy, in my opinion, is always to be responding to the things that are wrong with society in that moment. Most people say that the job of the comedian is to make people laugh. Yes, it is. But is that all? I don't think so. I think comedians should be saying, this is what the mainstream narrative narrative is, and here are the holes in it. Comedians should be trying to take society forward, and they should be always pushing back against the mainstream because the mainstream is the authority. Whereas what's happening now is that you have a culture where comedians are essentially buying into mainstream culture. They are the woke ones. They are the super woke. Comedians are super woke. I am massively hated by people in the comedy world because I'm not. So I'll have plenty to talk about. No problem there. I mean, to me, when I go to comedy, legit comedy shows, comedy stand-up shows like I did last night, they, they mm. are sacred to me. Um, mm. They are absolutely hilarious, but it, it's a testament to the First Amendment in my mind in this country and reminds me that we do live in a in a, in, a, in a free society. I, I want to close with this quote, and, and I would love to get your, your thoughts on this. Um, you know, I think you've mentioned this during the conversation that you're a recent dad. Uh, and this is the quote. I also have never been more optimistic in the last few years than I am now. It could just be the upcoming fatherhood, now fatherhood for you, is forcing me to take an optimistic view, which is extremely unnatural. <laughs> 
which is extremely unnatural for me, both as an individual and as a Russian. I've been very surprised by the West's reaction to Ukraine, very pleasantly so. I want to add one comment about comedy in general, because I think I've heard you say this before, that Putin's first act in ascendancy to power was to remove comedians from public view. That that was one of the first, if not the first things that, that he did when he ascended to political power. I think I think I, you, you said that in a, in a prior interview. It was a specific a comedy program, a satirical program, yeah. And that is the power of, of comedy, I think, as you eloquently put in that quote, which I just read out. Well, was, I don't know. Have you ever seen Game of Thrones? Parts of it, but I've, I've never been obsessed like so many people are. Well, if you've watched it to, I think, season one or season two, if you remember the King Joffrey, this absolutely evil uh, boy king, uh, there is a scene in which uh, he has a, um, a jester's tie, uh, tongue removed for offending him somehow. And if you look at literature and movies and, and storytelling in general, that is quite often how the madness of a ruler is portrayed or his not necessarily madness, but his descent into absolute totalitarianism and brutality uh, by destroying comedians or imprisoning them or tearing their tongues out, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, it was very significant that Vladimir Putin, the first thing he did when he came to power is uh, remove the one satirical program in Russia that actually dared to make fun of everybody. I talk about it in the book as well. Um, so of course that, that is absolutely true. Comedy uh, has satire. Satire has that power. Uh, and the reason I think you enjoy going and seeing a comedian uh, talk about difficult subjects and make jokes about them is, uh, you know, the job of a comedian, uh, in my opinion, and look, everybody defines that differently for themselves. I'm not saying people who don't want to have a satirical element to their comedy are not comedians. People can do it whichever way they want. I'm just talking about my interpretation. It's always been, you know, people like Carlin and Hicks and, and people like that. They, they were people who were articulating some of the the gaps the problems some of the things that you know you were being told but they weren't quite true or you were being asked to buy into but they were not quite true uh, and i think that's that's the greatness of comedy it has the power to expose some of those things without making you depressed and deeply uncomfortable at the same time because sometimes if you look reality in the face without that sweetener you know it's pretty tough so it's it's the it's the it's the the sugar pill that makes the medicine go down, uh, and it, and I think it's very important and uh, very significant when comedy starts to be restricted. It's what all the dictators always do; they don't want to be laughed at because laughter is power. Um, I want to I want to sneak in one one final comment to your thoughts on, but before I do, I I just want to tell you how much I personally appreciate you doing this because I have been a massive fan um, for at least a couple of years now, and. You know, I mentioned this earlier in the conversation that I think your your work has really helped to clarify in my own mind the world in a way. And um, I really have a deep you know, the beauty of this show for me is I often get to meet people I really admire and allow them to have as much time as they'd like to give to to talk about what matters to them. And this has been a, a real privilege to me, and i I know that I will continue to follow your work for a long time and really appreciate what you and Francis do. You well, Dan, I really appreciate you saying that and having me uh, on the show. And again, apologies for uh, messing you around for such a long time. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you. I wore this shirt just so that we could be buddies uh, <laughs> for this. Uh, no, but I, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's always heartening to hear that, um, you know, what we do is useful and helpful to other people. I think people are desperate for it. And I, I, I certainly count myself among them. You know, you you use the word optimism in the quote that I read about yourself, and you know, you were wondering if if it was recent fatherhood that was bringing mm. that about in you. You know, we we barely touched on the war itself, but I, I would love in closing to get any thoughts you have on where you think that might be going. And I mentioned this earlier that we are storytelling animals, and I think mm. it is really important to have accurate stories that we're telling ourselves that keep us cohesive together and you know not to continue to reiterate this but the the, the themes the stories that 
you hope your book will convey that the values that people will take some pride in and realize are are secularly sacred um, and, and something that that we should give some proper respect to. I'd love to close and just give you an opportunity to, to address those if there, anything else might come to mind. Yeah, well, the war is, is very hard to talk about because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I would say that after the initial phase in which Ukraine did very well uh, and prevented Russia from taking over half the country after it invaded from several different directions, and uh, now what's happening in the east is Russia is creeping its way forward. It's taken a lot of casualties, but it's it's making forward progress. Uh, partly because even though I do think the West response has been very pleasantly surprising, uh, the Ukrainians lack the artillery they need. Um, and they don't look like they're getting it or planning to be, you know, it, it doesn't look like the West is planning to give them what they need. So I'm, I'm not all that optimistic there, although I really do hope to be wrong. Uh, but I do also, I am optimistic in the sense that I think this has given us a kick in the, in the behind that the West has needed to at least understand that there are external threats that we have to concern ourselves with. Um, but, you know, when I say I'm optimistic, it, it does not mean that I am convinced that we are destined for a better world. Um, I don't know what world we're destined for, but it, I think what I meant with my son coming along is um, I hope that he and people like him, if we do our jobs right, will be in a position to continue to fight for the things that I'm trying to fight for. Uh, because as long as we exist, there's hope. Uh, whereas if we bring up generations or more generations of clueless young people who don't understand history, who don't understand the value of what we have, who don't understand that we have enemies, who don't understand that we live in the le least racist, sexist, bigoted societies in the history of humanity, if they don't understand any of this, th th then we're in trouble. So I'm optimistic in the sense that I may be simply in the sense that I now feel that I have some ability to influence it because I've got a little one that if I raise him right, might be able to contribute to this in the way that I hope to in the rest of my life as well. So um, that's what I mean. I, 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 um, I, you know, predicting the future is impossible and, and kind of pointless. I just think that as an individual, it's helpful to uh, live with the sense that you are able to control some of the outcomes in your life. Uh, and as I live my life more and as I go on, I find that that's more and more true for me. Mm -hmm. So that, I guess that's all I mean. It's, it's probably not a very reassuring message to, to anyone listening, but I guess what I feel like is if you try and uh, take control of your life and speak the truth, even when it's difficult and take the licks for it when it's necessary and continue to move forward and continue to stand up, then enough other people will do the same. Uh, and that's, and, you know, I'm not the original person in that story. I've seen other people do it before me and followed their lead and followed their example. And I guess as custodians of that, it's like the sacred flame. We have to pass it on to others. And I'm optimistic that I now have someone to pass it on to. Uh, that, that's really all I've got. Yeah, I think that's a great place to close. Thank you again, man. It was really great to meet you. And I, I so appreciate you doing this and the work that you do. Dan, thank you so much. I really appreciate it as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Keep Talking. If you're finding value in this podcast, please consider supporting the show via the links below on Venmo, PayPal, or Patreon. Your support helps to make these conversations possible. 